right, so welcome everybody. Thanks. Um, this is, I realize it's the last session of the day, and I haven't had a coffee for a while, so um, let's see how it goes. Um, as I was saying a little bit earlier, I'm really going to do this sort of 50,000 foot view rather than trying to get too deep into the weeds, but I really hope it does give you an overview as to what you should be considering, where you'll be lying, who you should be talking, what type of questions, most importantly, you should be asking around a specific area. So the agenda is fairly simple. There's a little bit of, I'm going to go around a little bit of theory, like what is PCI, why is it important? Um, and then as a service provider, to be PCI compliant, what do they have to go through? So as, a, as opposed to a merchant, just to give you an idea as to how complex this whole process is and why a lot of it you need to outsource. And then the practical implication for nonprofits. And then I've got some fun statistics at the end, which has got nothing to do with PCI, I forget to it. So a little bit about fraudsters. Um, Unfortunately, nonprofits are huge targets for fraudsters, and they are mega, mega smart. They use a whole bunch of really cool tricks to try and defraud charities. Now, the interesting thing is, is that they, you, you, there's no sort of Robin Hood in this world where someone steals from someone else and goes and gives it to a charity. What they do is they use charities to try and steal from other people. And the median loss that we, we detect um, is around about $85,000 for your average nonprofit. It's sort of, you know, you get big nonprofits and small ones. We've got one nonprofit that they get hacked probably 40 or 50 times a day in an attempt to try and run what I'll touch on now with regards to um, the, the fraud that happens in the nonprofit space. And that median loss is essentially every rejected transaction is a, is a fee. Right, so the charity gets hit with that. First of all, second of all, if a, if a transaction does go through, then the person's going to try and charge that back. And then also, that also goes to the charity. So it's, it's a huge thing. So what do they do? Probably the most common ones is credit card tumbling. It's called name and, name and card tumbling. What they do is they, they steal credit cards or websites. And they get thousands of these things. And what they do is they create a bot, they find an easy target. Nonprofits are the easiest targets with regard to donation forms because you don't have to set up an account, you don't have to buy a product, you don't have to go through anything other than putting a credit card number in, see the expiry date and a one, $1 transaction. And off you go. What is also not known that well is, is that credit cards are not validated against a person's name. So you can literally put Donald Duck in your next transaction, try it. You can put Donald Duck, put your credit card in, and it's going to pass. So what happens is these guys will use the same name, different credit card numbers, and they'll tumble it through a website. And they can run bots that do 200, 300, 400 in a minute. Just doof, And it's actually interesting, there's a guy this morning that came and spoke to me about it, because I spoke to him about this yesterday on the floor, and their, their charity was hit with 80 of these name tumbling things this morning. Because he got a phone call and said, 80 transactions went through on their website for one dollar. And that's the reason why credit card companies see nonprofits as high risk. These fraudsters go in, they run thousands of transactions, and as soon as they find a credit card that passes, they use that credit card to go buy their Rolex watch. And so that's how they use the nonprofit. The other typical thing is refund scam. This is just unbelievable what these guys do. So what they do is they put in a $5,000 donation to a charity. They'll phone up the charity and they'll say, um, sorry, I was meant to put in $500. So you can keep the $500, but this is with a stolen credit card, right? So they don't have their own credit card. They'll, they'll steal a credit card, they'll do a 5,000 donation, they'll phone it to the charity and say, I'm meant to do 500, can you refund me the 4,500? Please, can you refund it against this credit card? Right, which is a different one, which is their personal one, and that's how they defraud $4,500. At the end of the day, the guy whose credit card was stolen will pick it up, charge back to the charity, the charity has lost five grand. This is the thing. Creation of chain, uh, phone charities. So that refund scam is something that you as charities or nonprofits should really take notice of because that is quite rife. Creation of phone charities is something that we deal with almost on a daily basis, but especially when there's major disasters in the world. So if there's a mudslide in the world somewhere, you won't believe how many charity requests we get to say, we're a charity to collecting funds to save this family that was lost in mudslides. We just get hit with those. And, that, 
And we, we almost set one up. They were so professional. The bank statements were spot on. The receipts were spot on. The checks were spot on. Everything was fantastic. And it's only when we got sort of two levels deep in the directors that we find that there was a fraudulent uh, connection. And it's disappeared. So that's something that we deal with. So that's the main problems that you sit with. So the ways to stop there, there's a bunch of tools out there. Um, there's velocity checking. So this velocity checking is one I've just spoken to you about now. So 50 transactions, if it's the same amount from the same IP address with the same name, it's, it's going to be fraudulent. You've got to look, sometimes you do get, very seldom, but you do sometimes get families contributing to the same charity at the same time, so it's the same name, different credit cards, same amount, and then it looks fraudulent. So that happens occasionally, so we, ch we check for those sorts of things. But it's very seldom more than four or five. If it gets to 10, then you know there's something wrong. Address verification is a great one as well. It's, the problem with address verification is it's a fantastically blunt tool. The problem with it is, is that if I type in street, but on my bank records it's strt dot, it chucks it up. So you, I don't know if you've ever been victim to trying to remember the correct street address when there was a payment, when you're trying to donate or pay for something, and then address verification. It is a nightmare. Is there a space in your um, postal code? Chuck it up. EBS is not smart, you're saying. It's not smart at all. And the, the problem is UK is a big one. So P019 space 6YD is typical. Banks will concatenate that without the space. So sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't, and it just chucks it out. Um, CVV2 capability. This is a, if you're doing online donations, make sure that you capture the CVV2 number. Make it a mandatory field. You will not believe how many online payment, uh, online Charities or nonprofits don't make, don't even capture the CVV2 number. They basically, it's considered an offline transaction and there's no verification of that card at all. So be very, very, just make sure if you're doing online, if you're doing batch or you're doing recurring, you're not allowed to store it, so it's illegal to store the CVV2 number. Yes. So the first transaction, the first online transaction that you do, you can, um, you've got to capture, just make sure that that's a mandatory field. Interestingly enough, if it's a MOTO thing, so MOTO, it's not necessary. Right? So you can, lots of times you can phone in and you can give your credit card. You, you don't really need to give your, uh, your CV2 because they're assuming you are in possession of your card. So therefore, and there's a fraud to the phone thing. But how often are you going to get a fraudster sitting with 50,000 cards and phoning charities to check if those cards are valid? Right? So CV2 is not that important for phoning, but for online it's critical. IP blocking is, one of the things we've got in our extension is, is that when a donor donates money, we collect the IP address of that machine and we compare that to the BIN of the credit card. So the first five four or five characters of a credit card is called the BIN number. And that states the country, the bank that it was originated from and all those sorts of things. It's a bunch of really useful information. So the chances are very good that it's fraudulent if the bin country of five transactions are American and they're all coming from the same Nigerian IP address, right, in Western European address. So we've got those sort of fraud tools built into the back. And, and I'm gonna harp on this a little bit. There's a lot of payment processes that claim they've got fraud tools. Ask them very specifically, is it non-profit fraud tools or is it for-profit fraud tools? For-profit fraud tools are very different to non-profit. They don't worry about Bin checking, well, some of them do worry about bin checking because that's actually quite important. But they don't worry about tumbling because the person's not going to go and try and buy an iPad 60,000 times to check verification of the cards. So they tend to have their fraud checking more around e-commerce and stuff as opposed to donations. Um, and then minimum transaction limit. Lots of fraudsters will use $1 or $1.20 or $1.30. Um, just put in a, 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 a minimum amount. And then obviously your payment forms. So you get different types of payment forms. Uh, you get an iframe, you get a direct post. Those are the different types of forms. And actually sending the information from that donation form to us as a payment processor, to the payment processor. It can either go via your server or go directly to us. All those things add up as well as with regards to security. And
and especially from CI compliance. But I'll touch on that a little bit later. So uh, this is just a quick screenshot of our fraud tools and uh, uh, kind of various selections. But you can see here, enable name tumbling, block these transactions that are four if there's a reject 15 of the same name, different card number that are within 24 hours. So the idea really is you don't want to, you don't want to stop processing. It could be a genuine thing. So you don't want to stop, completely block out don donation processing on your website. So ideally what this does is that you, you as soon as the fraudster enters your site and starts hacking you or, or trying to attack you, make these, make these rules very strict, he will go away. It's just these guys move around all the time. So as soon as he goes away, just release your fraud tools. Just say, okay, we'll just make it normal again. But just card tumbling, bin checking, IP settings, so enable IP checking, glossy check, what countries do you want to check on, which ones do you want to re compare against, etc., etc. et cetera. Yeah. So I bring this up more not to plug I, it's <coughs> more to say, if you're using a payment processor, just ask that question. It's very, very important. What's the, what's the kind of time frame on that? You say it will go away very quickly. What, how would you go very quickly? What happens is these guys tend to sit in front of their computers and just stare at them. It's like most geeks love watching that little, I'm uploading your computer with latest status stuff. They, some of them go away within hours. Um, but some of the smarter guys will, will attack a site for two, three hours. If they get no success, they'll move to another one. And tomorrow they'll try this one again. So um, it's probably good to keep it up for two, three days and then you'll see the stuff goes away. Cystic Fibrosis, which is one of our largest clients, they, um, they get tons of these uh, attacks all the time. Switch it on, leave it on for a day or two, switch it off again. As soon as they see it, we find them, they switch it on. So it turns on. So what is PCI? Um, so payment card industry data security standards. Unbeknownst to most people, all merchants. If you've got a merchant account, you are in scope for PCI. It's as simple as that. It's not a case of I'm a small person and all my stuff is shipped off and to some other PCI. You have to be PCI uh, compliant. It's you know that's law. A um, lot of, lot of charities and nonprofits who've got a merchant account think, oh, because we only do five thousand a year, we exempt. You know, if you've got a merchant account, you have to be PCI compliant. The big thing, the nice thing about PCI really is, it can be extremely onerous, but the beauty of it is that it creates a fantastic framework to ensure safe handling of credit card data. You really don't want to get breached. If you get breached and you get charged, you get um, fined, it can be a lot of money. But there's also an element of it that's saying, can I sleep well at night knowing that I've got all the processes in place that's protecting someone else's money, essentially? Because you're entering a little bit of a sacred trust. That's how we see it at night. We're entering a little bit of a sacred trust to say, we are managing someone else's money into someone, some other person's bank account. Let's be, be good stewards of how we manage that. So PCI really creates, creates a fantastic sort of framework for you to look at and say, am I doing these things? Some, some of them are pretty obvious, but some of them are not so obvious, but they're really good things to implement. Um, enables prevention, detection, and appropriate handling of incidents, which obviously mean certification helps build donors' trust. That's also a huge thing. You know, just saying I'm PCI certified, everything's good to go, it just gives a huge element of, of you know, um, so how do you do it? There are essentially two ways of becoming PCI compliant. Um, the one is through a self-assessment questionnaire, and the other one is through a report of compliance. Using an inter independent service assessor or a quality service assessor. Essentially, the ROC is, is for more hectic stuff. So like caging, for instance, you send out an email, send out a direct mail, and you get a whole lot of checks back, or you, you get back credit card, where someone's written the credit card back to your business. What's the process of managing those credit cards? Who's capturing it into what system? Who's got access to those credit card numbers? Where is it being stored? How's it been destroyed? Um, et cetera, et cetera. So PCI goes beyond the system that you're using. It goes into the systems and the processes that you're adopting to make sure that information is clear. The best way to explain it is you can have a fully PCI compliant CIVI CRM on CIVI on PCI servers and everything is beautiful, 
but you're standing in the street corner and you're charging for your lemonade with credit cards and the person is writing down the credit card numbers on a piece of paper. That's out of compliance. Unless there's a process. Does that person have a box to put it in? Is the box secure? Blah, blah, blah. So it's around how you collect all information around credit cards. So the way you do it is you identify your level of compliance. It's the next slide. You go through a SAQ, and then there are different types of SAQs depending on the system and the process. So levels. So essentially, any merchant, so level one, we'd be level one, right? Because we do tons of transactions. So it's any merchant, uh, merchant regardless, regardless of the acceptance channel. So whether that's uh, manual via computer thing or whatever the channel is, we've got to be compliant to six million transactions. One to, two, one to six million, level two, level three, 20 to 20,000 to one million. Level four is any merchant processing fewer than 20,000. So to give you an idea, um, I'm gonna have to jump out here because let just see, there we go, so we'll look at my, so for Civi CRM, we processed 7,000 transactions, I should remember this. Um, so if you think from January to March, for 84,000, so which is essentially 84,000 transactions if you sort of go across the entire year, that's for everybody that's processing through us at the moment. Right, so 20,000 is actually quite a lot of transactions. That means that pretty much everybody in the Civi CRM platform is going to be under 20,000. There's going to be very few really big people that are under 20,000 here. SAQs, so you get different types of SAQ types. You get an A, AEP, so this is version 3, B, BIP, high level. You don't have to, unless you are actually doing a point of sale and you're doing imprints and things like that, that's B and IP. C is where you've got a virtual terminal, web-based virtual terminals. Um, merchants with hardware pay terminals included in PCI point-to-point -point encryption stuff is, is, is that one. So 99.9% .9 of all Civi CRM people are going to fall into either A, A, E, P, or B. Okay, so A is its card present, the card all the cardholder data functions are outsourced. So literally everything, it's the web, the, the web page is outsourced, the server is outsourced, the software is outsourced, everything is outsourced. You literally don't look after anything. AEP is sort of, everything's outsourced bar one or two small processes. We'll touch on that now. B is everybody else. So this just gives a little bit more shopping carts, internet outsources A, shopping cart for payment page entirely outsourced, EP shopping cart but partially outsourced. And this is probably a little bit more clear to say if you're doing under 20,000, which is probably everybody in Civi, or most of everybody in Civi, and you've got a redirect page, then you'll, be, you'll need to fill out a SACWA A. If you've got an iframe, SACWA A. If you've got a direct post, you need a SACWA A EP because that means it's partially outsourced. Right, so an iframe and a redirect is completely outsourced to the payment provider. Direct post is it's on your website, the original transaction is on your website, and then it gets posted to the payment processor. So it's partially outsourced. So that's why it's EP. JavaScript, probably it's the same as you originate the JavaScript, then you send it out to the processor, EP, XML, and anything else is SACWA EP. Okay, so that's where it comes down to who's, what your payment processor, your hosting provider, are they PCI compliant? The, the form that they produce is on PCI, PCI compliant servers, that sort of stuff. So what do you need to do? Um, obviously the first thing is talk to your merchant provider. One of the big things is what tools are available? How do you do it? How do you actually implement it? So SACWA, if you, go, you go SACWA A, SACWA A, EP, they're actually fairly easy questionnaires to go through. B is a little harder. Big thing with B is, is that you actually need a security assessor to, to scan, to, to confirm that what you said in your self-attestation is true. So that's the big difference between A and EP. It's same for us, A and B, is A, you just make a statement. B, you actually need someone to go and scan your servers and your systems. And this is probably the most important thing. Train your staff to know what to look out for. So like it, when I told you earlier, the refund policies, what are the account patterns for typical fraud? Again, it's, it's less about the system and it's more about the process. Most PCI hacks happen as a result of process as opposed to system. 
you follow a good process and you, you've got it all documented, you tend to be okay. So this is a um, very complex slide detailing 50,000 foot view of a service provider. So say for instance you hosted at a, so Pantheon was one of the guys that I did this talk with at DrupalCon earlier this year, or last year was, this is all the stuff they need to do to become PCI compliant as a, uh, as a host, so as a, as a provider. And it is hectic, it is unbelievably onerous. So finding a, a supplier that can give you PCI compliance is, is fantastic. And if they do charge you more, you gotta understand why. A lot of hosting providers will actually do everything in here, but not go through that final attestation. So if you know what type of questions to ask, you can actually ask, do you do this, do you do this, do you do this? And if they say yes to everything, you, although they're not PCI certified, they are following all the PCI certification rules and they may not just be in the final certification because it costs an absolute bomb. So just, just be wary of that. You know, there are, there are guys that are just gonna host it in a box under a desk somewhere and you, you're gonna get to the second question and they go, uh, no. But other guys, you're gonna go through and they're gonna answer all those questions and you can be you know, happy that they are okay. So again, it's just a case of teaching yourself what are the questions to ask and know. Clearly, if you can get yourself a proper PCI hosted environment, that's the way to go. Because those guys really do, they, they jump through unbelievable hoops. And we go through an audit every year as well. And it essentially, it shuts down. We have five auditors come into our office uh, in Vancouver and it, the whole office shuts down for five days. And they sit there and they go through every single piece of paper. They'll go through random checks on merchant applications, who signed it off, who wrote it, who saw it, did it even have an ability to get out the front door, who's got access to the front door, and it's unbelievable. Who's got access to servers, where the server even exists, passwords, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, so it is a big thing, but it's something you don't have to worry about if you find the right partner. So yes, there is, a, there is you can do this and remain safe. It's, it's not the end of the world. I sort of painted the worst picture there is, but it is possible, but it is important. If you want to keep it really basic, take a basic strategy, outsource as much as you possibly can. Try to keep this in-house and keep those, keep those things, all those processes and everything running successfully, especially on your systems, is a lot of work and almost a full-time job. See if you can outsource it, outsource it to um, you know, a hosting provider or an expert who can come in and help you with that as much as you can. Amazingly, it may cost you a fortune up front, well, it wouldn't cost you a fortune, it might cost you a bit up front, but it can save you a fortune in the long run. Um, minimize as much as you can in-house in things that can affect, if you go through the SACWA A and SACWA EP and the SACWA D, go through that and just learn it and you'll see the stuff that you can outsource. Minimize the stuff that you're gonna, you wanna take and onboard yourself and work very, very hard to try and stay in the A and the um, and then make sure you understand, just learn about it. It's, just, it's like taxes, you know, you're ignorant about your taxes. Because unfortunately it does bite. But don't avoid it. And this is unfortunately a lot of people do. They just bury their head and say, it's not going to affect me. Even if you just go through the very basics of understanding the process or the framework, not even even impl implementing it fully, but understanding the impact of the changes, that the small changes that can have a huge impact, do that. Um, just by the pure common sense of the whole SACWA thing, some policies are just a good idea anyway. Um, don't sacrifice user experience. This is another thing that's a bit of a problem. Is that people will go and they'll buy a system or they'll implement a system that is so onerous that you end up not getting any donors or any users using them. So there is a balance, make sure you understand that balance. So we've got a bunch of stuff that we can help as well. Dang, actually, I've got a bunch on my table, I need to bring them up here, but we've got a white paper, we've got a um, you know, sort of basic infographic, 
detailing the different types of frauds that you get. We've got a white paper on our website that you can look at that details the type of fraud and how you can avoid it. Um, what is PCI? One of the big things you can do is, and I did actually do this in on purpose, the Drupal one, because it's actually very good at DrupalPCICompliance.org. It's actually a very, very good website for Drupal users, but it's, it, 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 you can really use it and apply it to the rest of the service as well. And then PCI security standards. Now this one specifically, this link specifically, if you just go to standards.org, you're gonna get lost in the quagmire of PCI. But you go to the security standards documents, that one gives you, it's a fantastic, it shows all the documents, it says, how do, what is PCI SACRA? What is, the, what is version three? Um, why do you need to do it? And they're really like very easy to digest, two to three pages. PCI has done a good job on that. And lower down, you'll actually see where documents that you can download, which is your SACRA A, SACRA EP, and your SACRA D um, forms that you can literally read through and work, work through it. And that's it. If you've got a couple of minutes, I've got some interesting stats that you might enjoy. It's got nothing to do with PCI. Types of print donation processing services used. So this is a study that was done by these boys, Campbell Rinka, a couple of years back. But it is actually quite interesting to see the amount of, and this is just non-profit industry stuff, right? So this is not anybody else other than not non-profits. 62% uh, is online donations. 30% is recurring donations. So it's quite high. Uh, donations in person, 25%, so that would literally be face-to-face. -face. Mail check donations, 20%. Um, text to donate, 7%, and international donations. What's interesting is this whole text to donate thing was a, like, a huge spike, it was this massive thing, and it fell flat instantly. Don't know why. Are these percentages amounts or number of transactions? Yeah. Yeah, amounts, volume. Volume? Sorry? Oh. Sorry? You're saying that online donations So for... Well, the percentages don't add up to 100. So we're trying to figure out what you want to measure. Yeah, like automatic returning. International and online, right? Yeah. So what's, online. Like, what's 100%? What's the universe? Yeah, what is the universe? I think it's 3,500 non-profits that we... Um, oh, these, that, these non-profits take donations online. Correct. 62% take donations yeah. online. Correct. 20% use online shops. Correct. So they use, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So they use payment processing to right. do recurring. Sorry, I should have explained my brain going back. No, no, no. Thanks. I should have explained it better. Some of them can do all these things. Exactly. That's why it doesn't have to That's what we were trying to do. Okay. So you're saying that 93% don't even try to do text to donate. Correct. Do you have any trends on that? We're waiting. We're waiting. No, I wish. No, I, I re I'm waiting for these guys, and they, they're due to do another research on this again, but it's not out yet, and I think they're, they're hoping to do it next year. That'll be fascinating, um, especially some other slides that I'll get onto just now. Um, this is actually, this was a bit of an eye-opener for me, is the number of um, donations that are done that are automatically associated with a con uh, um, constituent. So... 45% of donations are not related to a donation record in any in, in an, another CRM system. Yeah, yep. So it's literally, they've got it in the CRM system, but they're donating via their payment processor, but there's no integration. See now. It's scary that it's so high though. Satisfaction of the services rating. So how satisfied are nonprofits with their payment processors? So reliability of service, the highest speed, so the receipt of payments, your funding of your accounts. So in other words, when you make a payment, when a person donates, how quickly does it end up in your bank account? And this is interesting when you start splitting out merchant providers and aggregators who take weeks to get it in. Ease of use, very sa pretty satisfied, reporting available, features provided, 7.1 cost, and integration with software your organization uses. It's quite amazing that as a payment processor, this information is quite critical to say, if I can just integrate, I'll have a huge market. Or if I can provide really good reporting, and I can have, have, have additional features. 
is why I'm in silicon, because I'm working on that, that, and that. <laughs> <laughs> this was also very interesting in terms of the install base versus locally installed versus using an internet solution. So the blue and the orange essentially is smaller nonprofits, and the orange is the nonprofits doing more than a million dollars a year, so larger ones. So there's very little difference between small and large, but there's quite a big difference. What was interesting to me is how many are still locally installed as opposed to fully cloud-based solutions that they are using. Again, this is the one that I want to see the trend on. Solutions used. Um, so this is just a breakdown of the size of the um, nonprofits. So out of the number of respondents to this particular one, so it was a particular one. Okay, I'll get to that later. Less than 100K, 7%, 100 to 400. So you can see there's a fairly good spread of nonprofits they, they finally chose. But this is the interesting thing, is the primary solution used. Raises Edge, Donor Perfect, Giftworks, eTapestry, Salesforce, FileMaker Pro, Results Plus, Sage. Now what's interesting is, is that they were asked specifically what payment processor they're using. <laughs> How many of those? Yeah, it's they, it's, it's, those are applications. Yeah. <laughs> and the, the telling thing behind that is, is a lot of nonprofits don't actually understand, don't even know the payment processes that they're using. I go to so many shows and they look at me and they go, I think we use you, but I don't know. <laughs> so, if, I mean, that's a significant portion, it's just applications. I don't think your pro is a processor. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it raises edge, it's not a processor. We process for a razor's edge. Yeah, right. We do eighty percent of razor's edge is processing. Um, Salesforce.com. What's interesting is that Salesforce and Salesforce together make five percent. So that's another trend that will be interesting to see over a period of time. Talisma. We we do all of Talisma's payment processing. So it's just amazing to see how people just don't actually understand that. Then uh, data snap, data trash, exceed fundraiser, Genzabar. Orange Leap, QuickBooks, Sage Fundraising, Team Approach. And that is the end of